welcome to River Hills Christian Church. My name is Angel and we're so happy that you're here this morning. Thank you for tuning in to our online service. Please comment down below to let us know that you're here. If it's your first time joining us, please let us know that as well. We'd be happy to meet you. Here at the River, there are so many ways to connect. We have community groups, youth ministry, children's ministry, and more. We'd love for you to check these out. I've been a part of the River for almost five years now. I love watching service online. However, I love going on campus as well to engage with my brothers and sisters in Christ. This has been very fulfilling for me and I'm sure it will be for you as well. Also, you get to enjoy live service and live worship. Thank you again for tuning in. Let's get ready to worship. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find His mercy. Come to the table, He will satisfy. Taste of His goodness, find what you're looking for. Tell them hello and have a seat. Well, good morning. We are so glad that you 
are here, whether that's in person here in Loveland or you are online, we are so glad that you've joined us today for an amazing worship service. And if you are new here, we want to say we are so glad that you've chosen to join us today. You can scan this QR code, you can stop by the Welcome Center, or if you're online, you can just put it in the chat and we'll have someone reach out to you. But here's the thing, I know that sometimes it can seem overwhelming when you're a new person in a new place, and I just got to tell you, I'm with you. I'm, I'm a new guy, but what I've got to tell you is some of the best people you will ever meet are sitting around you. And uh, this is such an amazing church, and you're going to love to get to know people here. So let us know that you're here, and we'd love to connect and help you find out more, answer any questions you have. And uh, one way to find out a lot of information about River Hills is to download our app. And so if you haven't done that yet, get in your app store, whatever kind of device you have, and you can get the app and find out all the information you'd want to know about River Hills. Next Sunday, after this service, we've got a, uh, a class, I don't know if that's the right term for it, but we've got something called Join the River. If you've been looking for more information on what all happens at River Hills, if you are going, man, I, I, I want to take this next step in my journey, how do I get more involved, how do I become a member, this is the class for you. So we provide some food. It's a great opportunity to hang out with other people that are in the same boat as you and just get more involved and really get connected to what God's doing here. Giving is such an important part of your faith journey. And Jesus tells us it's more blessed to give than receive. And I've got to tell you, one of my favorite times uh, is when I get to give back to God just a portion of what he's given to me. So there's many ways to do that here. Uh, you can see those on the screen. Or if you're here in person on your way out, if you came prepared to give, there'll be people at the doors with some offering bags that you could put your offering in. Or if you want to stop by the Welcome Center and do that, but you can give on our app, you can give online. There's many ways to do it. And I just encourage you uh, just to give because there's so many amazing things that are happening here. Two weeks from today, we start a brand new series called Game On. Football season is starting to ramp back up, and we're excited about it, and we're going to capitalize on that with some of the energy and excitement that comes along with it. I don't know about you, but this weekend, it just started to feel a little bit like fall. The weather, you know, gave us a little glimpse of what's to come, but also, you know, we got to have some preseason football. I know we weren't too excited about what, uh, what we saw on Friday night, but... Hopefully those are greater things to come. We're excited about it. And what we're going to do here at church is we're going to spend three weeks looking at what it looks like if we say, hey, you know what, game on. Let's get fully invested. Let's, let's get excited about what God's doing here. And let's put forth our best this season as we follow after Jesus. Well, today, Jeff's going to come out in just a few moments after we sing a couple more songs. He's going to continue our series, this three-part series, with part two on revealed in the spirit as he walks through revelation and i don't know if you were here last week if not catch it online but i love the way that jeff teaches through revelation he demystifies it and makes it something that gives you peace gives you courage and you're going to be encouraged today i listened to the message first service and you're going to walk out of here full of courage and ready to go but before we do that we're going to sing a couple worship songs. And again, I don't know where you're at in your journey with your faith. I don't know what kind of season of life you've come through or you're headed into or you're currently in. But I can tell you for me, this next song we're about to sing is very personal. That I've been through some difficulties. But no matter what life has thrown at me, I can sing of the goodness of God that all my life He's been faithful. Amen? Amen. And so let's stand together. Let's continue to worship this morning. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing 
of the goodness of God. Oh, my life, you have been faithful. Oh, my life, you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am able, oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. And I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. In darkest night, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend And I have lived In the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so
salvation comes my way And when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Thank you so very much that we can join together and lift you high in praise and worship, God. Come and fill us up to overflowing. Prepare our hearts today to receive your word, Holy Spirit. Be among us and be with us. We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Our world is often chaotic, filled with conflict and difficult to understand. Did today's headlines mark the end of the age? Where is God in times of international conflict? personal pressure, and the persecution of those who follow Jesus. How can I be faithful to Jesus? Revelation answers our questions. Revelation is too often hijacked. Bad teaching about this letter creates fear and uncertainty. But Jesus designed Revelation to give us courage and clarity. Revelation is a story of perspective. As believers in Christ, our perspective is God's final victory. At the end of it all, the message of Revelation is clear. God wins! Studying the book with this mindset allows us to experience God's truth, revealed. Good morning, friends. Hey, here at Loveland, out at Fayetteville, online, no matter where you're joining us, we're grateful that we get to be together today. But I have to confess, as we start today, I think we have a problem. Anybody here have a problem? I mean, we, we probably have multiple problems, but the problem I'm thinking about, maybe the best way to explain it is to tell you, I grew up in Foster, Kentucky. It's a little town in northern Kentucky, a rural town, and, you know, maybe 40, 50 buildings in the whole town, and, but the streets had street lights when I was a kid. Now, when it got dark and the street light came on, it was my signal to go home. I wasn't allowed to stay out after dark. But as I got older, I could stay out later. And after the streetlights came on, I knew every nook and cranny of that little town, and it, was, it felt very comfortable, very safe to walk around any time of day or night. But I confess, there was one street. If you went down past my house and turned left, there was no streetlight on that street for some reason, and there were some old houses there that just kind of creeped me out a little bit. So I didn't go there much after dark. But if you went down past my house and turned right, you went down the hill, across the bridge, out on the edge of town, there were no lights at all. I could look back and see the lights of Foster, but I remember walking that way as a kid, and I got in the dark, and around the corner was this old, decrepit house, and I was walking that way, and I suddenly stopped and said, nope, not going to do that. <laughs> you know, that was the problem. And here's the problem I think we face. Sometimes we're afraid of the end of the Bible. My buddy Dale was teaching a Bible study. He was going to start the book of Revelation, and a woman in, her, in his group said, I'm not going to do that. And he said, well, why not? He said, too scary, too scary. If you think of the book of Revelation like this, I, that's a problem. You know, the haunted house at the end of the road, the haunted house at the end of the Bible. Too many people conceive of Revelation in these terms. And the reality is, I agree, Revelation is too often hijacked. That's the problem. The problem is all the bad teaching that has been out there about the book of Revelation, it produces this fear and uncertainty in our lives that keeps us away from the blessing that God promises. But good teaching actually produces increased courage in our hearts and clarity about, about what God's up to in the world and about what things are, are going to happen. So in this series, what we're trying to do is simply 
strike a match in the darkness, right? To turn on the light and to make sure that the house at the end of the block is not scary at all. And the good news is, John actually gives us a a solution for understanding uh, the book of Revelation, for taking away the scariness. And he does it in really two ways. First of all, John tells us in the opening paragraph, just in the first 50 words, he tells us what Revelation is. He makes it crystal clear. We just blow by it sometimes and don't pay attention. He makes it clear, first of all, that Revelation is a letter. It was a letter written to real people. It starts like this, Dear seven churches. This is from John. I'm writing to all of you who live in this province of Asia. So it was written to real people living real lives in real cities. In fact, it is a pastoral letter, a letter designed to comfort Jesus' disciples who were living in times of intense pressure because of their faith in Jesus. The Roman Empire had been persecuting Christians to greater and lesser degrees for 30 years. And and John writes them, Jesus writes them to to give them kind of counsel in that that situation, but also to warn them that the worst is yet to come. It's going to get worse before it gets better. So these were real churches written at kind of the crossroads of the Roman Empire. Sometimes there were real battles in this region, but Jesus is telling them, you're living in a conflict zone because of your faith. Now, here's the hermeneutical principle we take away from this. Because this is a letter written to real people in real circumstances, guess what? It had real meaning to them. And Revelation cannot mean something to us that it did not mean to them. So the real meaning that Jesus intended was the meaning that they took away from this letter. So Revelation is designed to help believers who were living under pressure to shift their focus off the pressure and to strengthen their face faith by getting them to look more closely at Jesus and understanding what's going on in the world. In fact, Jesus invites them in the letter portion of this. The, the, the entire letter is built around this word. What is it? It's victory. It's, he wants them to have the Nike experience. He wants them to be more than conquerors, to share in the victory that God gives us. Second, John makes it clear that Revelation is prophecy. Here's what he says. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this what? Prophecy, you know, here's a prophecy. But again, I think we often misunderstand and confuse prophecy and its purpose. So here's Revelation. It is a prophetic message from Jesus. And what it's designed to do is to get people to contemplate, to ponder, to internalize. In fact, here's what John says. Happy, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and happy are those who take, who, who, who hear it, you know, receive it, and what? Take it to heart who internalize it, who mull it over, who chew on it, who contemplate it. In the words of that great theologian, Christopher Robin, here's what John wants. Think, poo. Think, think, think. Man, that's what the Spirit of God is saying to us today. Contemplate. Think about this. Take it to heart. And biblical prophecy, when it comes, is not primarily about God detailing all that's going to happen in the future. Actually, biblical prophecy is always primarily about what God is calling us to do right now. And the Spirit of God is always calling us to trust Him right now, to honor Him right now, to listen to Him and learn from Him right now, to be faithful right now. In fact, the prophetic message of Revelation is pretty clear. Stay faithful. Stay faithful because God wins, and we want to be on the winning side at the end of life. The third thing John says in these first 50 words, in fact, it's the very first word of his letter, is Revelation is apocalypse, the apocalypse from Jesus. This is is an unveiling. The, The Greek word apocalypsis, apocalypse, revelation means unveiling or disclosure. So this is Jesus pulling back the curtain, and he and he says, This was hidden from you, but now you can see the unseen. You can look behind the curtain. And so Jesus reveals realities of the unseen world that's all around us and beyond us. And He reveals these realities through vivid images, sounds, and even numbers and colors. I mean, it's all moving. It's a kaleidoscope of of impressions. And we understand this if we recognize that we've experienced other kinds of apocalyptic literature, like the Chronicles of Narnia or the Lord of the Rings, images that that speak to a hidden world and the conflict going on there. Anybody seen a Marvel movie, you know, in the last couple of years? 
You know, I mean, all this is about hidden conflict, about universe and worlds beyond our own where conflict rages, and it spills over into our life. I, any of you been uh, binge-watching Stranger Things? Okay, there it is. This, this is apocalypse. I mean, here's a whole hidden world with a conflict that's impacting this world. That's the message of Revelation. There is an unseen world that affects what's going on in this world, an unseen world beyond our own, and it has impact on our lives. Now, this apocalyptic imagery, these sights and sounds, it's all based, it's rooted in the Old Testament. In fact, of the 404 verses in Revelation, 278 of them refer back to the Old Testament. 68.8% of Revelation is, is founded in the Old Testament. So maybe one of the reasons we're afraid of that house at the end of the street is because we don't know much about the book of, uh, of the Old Testament books, about the things that are there. I love what Alistair Begg says about this apocalyptic literature. He says that in Revelation, the plain things are the main things, and the main things are the plain things. So some things are crystal clear in Revelation, including this. The, the imagery is designed to reveal that there is a cosmic conflict. We're part of it, and there is an ultimate outcome, and we can be part of that too. In fact, the outcome is clear. It's summed up in two words. What are those words? God wins. That's right. And in Christ, we win. So John begins by describing what Revelation is in the opening paragraph, and then he clearly tells us how Revelation is structured so we don't have to be afraid of it, so we can understand. In fact, when Revelation was written, John didn't say, you know, to the churches in, in Asia, verse 4, boom. I mean, he didn't put chapters and verses in there. That, those marks came 1,500 years later. John just wrote a document. And when it was read to people, it was read in one long reading. When people read it, they typically read it in one setting. And so the thing had an impression as a totality, as a whole. And John gives us clues about how he structured this communication. In fact, in Revelation, John shares four scenes, windows, pictures, perspectives, however you want to label it, of the ultimate reality, and he signals each scene because he sees each one of them in the Spirit. Four times he uses this phrase, in the Spirit, and each time he does, the perspective shifts, the scene changes. He opens a different window. He opens a different door. So scene one, we spent seven weeks on it, was Jesus in the seven churches. That was the perspective of Jesus operating with the church. And what do we see? We see Jesus counsels his church. He directs us. He tells us that he knows what is happening in your life and my life, and then he gives us victory. He calls us to share in his victory. In fact, this word victory repeated over and over and over again throughout this entire letter to the churches. Jesus wants us to be more than conquerors through our relationship with him, to share in his victory. Last week, we looked at scene two. It's the throne room perspective. It's the longest scene in the entire book. It goes from chapter four to chapter 16 in our markings today. But in this scene, there's one theme that dominates. The first scene was Jesus. Jesus, remember what I said? Jesus actually counsels his church. But in scene two, Jesus controls the universe. He's large and in charge. God reigns in glory on his throne. The earth is under judgment, and yet God's people are protected through all of it. I mean, it's glorious. And Revelation 17 brings another shift in perspective. So chapter 4, here's the perspective. Uh, there's a, a door standing open in heaven, and there is a, a, a scene that's unveiled to John. And the Spirit, he's, he's in the throne. He, he sees the, the throne room in heaven. But now the scene shifts. In scene three, we go to the wilderness. So we go from earth to heaven, back to earth in this third scene. And it's the wilderness perspective. The word wilderness is an interesting word in Greek. What do you think of when you think of wilderness? You know, for me, I, I think of, uh, you know, backpacking through Glacier National Park. I, I backpacked through the most remote trail in the 48 states uh, in uh, Glacier National Park. And, it, you know, it was wilderness. Boy, you could easily get lost. In fact, we were camping. One guy came in, asked, where am I? He was 12 miles from where he thought he was. He was lost. He used to get lost in the wilderness. Uh, maybe you think of the wilderness up in the Pacific Northwest, or maybe the, the kind of jungle wilderness that dominates in Asia uh, in certain countries. But the word here denotes something more than that. 
The word wilderness here actually denotes a wasteland in Greek. So imagine not just a a scene on earth, but a burned out scene on earth. You know, a scene where things have been destroyed, where things, there's a battle going on. So the angel carried me away, there it is, in the spirit, there's our marker, into a wilderness, a, a wasteland, a scene of destruction. And remember the question we're asking. It's not what's next, but, but the question is, what does John see? What does John hear? And instantly, John begins to hear about, well, God's enemies on the earth. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came to me and said, come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. This is called Babylon the Great. Now, I think you can make a good case that this Babylon the Great at that time would have probably been readily understood as the Roman government system, the, the Roman Empire. But, but here's this prostitute, this tempting situation. And, and not only is the prostitute there, but she has some allies. With her were the kings of the earth with whom she committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth, intoxicated by the wine of her adulteries. Now, notice the focus is earth, earth, earth. It's back in this world. And so here we see God has enemies in this world. And what's the outcome? Well, let me just give you the point. If you want to take a nap the rest of the message, you can do it. Here's, here's the, the main point of, cha- of scene three. Jesus conquers the devil. Got it? Amen, let's go home, right? I mean, here it is. Scene three unfolds. It's four chapters. And what we see are these realities. The world is a battleground, a conflict zone. And frankly, nobody likes to live in a conflict zone. I have a number of friends who live and work in the Ukraine. Guess what? Nobody's comfortable there now. It's horrific, the conflict, the displaced people, the death, the destruction. We don't often think of our world as that kind of scene, but it is that kind of scene, a battleground. This world is a wilderness of trouble, a wilderness of temptation, a wilderness of conflict. It is a burnout wasteland so far from what God intended it to be. Do you realize God created a perfect universe, a perfect world? It was a temple. God and man lived together in perfect communion until sin entered the picture. And everything was broken and destroyed. It's not getting better. It's getting worse, folks. The conflict is real. Jesus talked about it in the upper room. Right before he was executed, he says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have what? Not not scary nightmares about the end of the age, but peace, peace. In this world, you will have trouble. Anybody here had any trouble in your life? I mean, trouble comes, doesn't it? But take heart, I have have Nike'd the world. There's the victory word again. I've overcome the world. And I want you to share in my victory. So this is a conflict zone in that sense, a a place of trouble. But Jesus also says it's a place of temptation. He talks about a great prostitute that's alluring the peoples of the earth, saying, come, 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 commit adultery with me. You know, there's, there's a seduction to the rebellion against God, a temptation potential that's real in this life. Uh, the wisest men who ever lived wrote about it in Proverbs. Solomon said this, the lips of an adulteress drip honey, but her speech is so compelling, smoother than oil, but she's a baited hook. In the end, bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. She doesn't even know it. So there is a, a lure to the things of this world that's real. John is honest about that. But the conflict is also real. Listen to verse 3. The prostitute and her allies, the kings of the earth, the the merchants of the earth, they will wage war against the Lamb. So John makes it crystal clear. In this world, life is being conducted in a battle zone. But he doesn't just leave there. Here's what he says. They will wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will triumph over them because He is the Lord of lords. He is the King of kings. And with him will be his called, his chosen, his faithful followers. Do you you hear what John is saying here? What's he saying? Pick a side. That's what he's saying. Whose side do you want to be on at the end of the age? 
Do you want to be with Babylon and, and her partners? Uh, because they're going to be destroyed, or you want to be with the Lord who will triumph over them, the, the Lord of lords, the King of kings. Those who are called, those who are faithful followers will be victorious at the end of the age. Remember the message? What is it? God wins, and in Christ we win. Who's, who wants to be on the losing side? And yet so many people, so many people turn their back on the victory that God offers. This world is a conflict zone. Trouble temptation, conflict. Reality number two, God is always in control. Even when things seem to be out of control, God is in control. So there's this war raging around us, and in the middle of that conflict, guess what God does? God turns His enemies against one another. That's how powerful He is. His purposes will never be thwarted. Here's what Revelation 17 declares, the beast and the ten horns you saw hate the prostitute. So this prostitute had a sea beast and a land beast that were allies. But they attack her. They bring her to ruin. They leave her naked. They eat her flesh. She's burned with fire. Man, pretty nasty stuff. Why? Because God has put it in their hearts to accomplish His purpose. Do you realize that the purposes of God will never be thwarted? And God will even use His enemies to accomplish His purpose. That's how powerful He is. Our God is the supreme being of the universe. No one, no thing will ever stand against Him. When he says enough, it will be enough. And that's reality number three. God warns people to flee from judgment to come. Do you realize there's an end to all this? Judgment day is coming. Now, the truth is, you and I have an appointment with death, or should Jesus come again with the judgment to come? And we need to be ready because God's enemies are going to fall. Here's God's promise. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Everything that opposes itself against God will fall, will be destroyed. Whose side are you going to be on when that day comes? Because Babylon is doomed, here's what God says. Come out of her. <laughs> you know, distance yourself. Pick the right side. Come out of her, my people. Repent so that you don't share in her sins and so that you will not receive her plagues. There is a judgment that's real. It's to be avoided. Are you going to follow Jesus or not? Are you going to trust Jesus or not? Are you going to yield to Jesus or not? That's the choice we all face. And John's very clear. Jesus is very clear. Choose. Choose me. Choose life. Choose before it's too late because judgment day is coming. And then there's a fourth reality, and it's this. At the end of the age, King Jesus stands triumphant. He conquers all. I mean, this victory of, uh, this picture of Jesus, the victor, it, it, it is a picture of, that we desperately need. I've noticed in my life that I've encountered some people who really have no desire to be like Jesus. I mean, maybe some of you are that way. Maybe some of you have no desire to be like Jesus. I mean, why would I be like Jesus? You know, he was kind of wimpy. He got himself killed. Why would I want to be like that, you know? But the, the problem is, we don't know the real Jesus. What we often know are caricatures of Jesus, cartoons of Jesus. Maybe they catch a little glimpse of Jesus, but, but they miss so much that we get a distorted understanding of who Jesus is. You know, I, I've collected some of these characters. You, you maybe have seen them before. I mean, who would want to be like radioactive Jesus, right? He's glowing in the dark. I mean, his head is… Uh, just irritated. Now, I get it. Jesus is light, and I suppose the artists are trying to, to uh, convey that, but why in the world is Jesus holding His heart in His hand? I don't get that. I mean, this, who, would, who would want to be like this? Not me. Radioactive Jesus? Uh-uh. Or how about this? My good buddy Jesus, right? 10-4. This is Jesus with a gun rack in His pickup, and you're going fishing, you know? I mean, is that all Jesus is, my, you know, my, my buddy? Uh, some people only see Jesus, and I like this, it's Sunday school Jesus. Who didn't like this? Je this is Jesus, the meek and mild. Jesus who welcomes little children. He says, the kingdom of heaven's like this. Now, this is beautiful. I love Jesus' interaction with young people. He does value and love kids. But, but if this is your only understanding of Jesus, man, it's so distorted. And this is a really big distortion of Jesus. This one creeps me out. My boyfriend, Jesus. 
Doesn't that weird you out like me? You know, I'm not even going to talk about it. How about this? Bearded lady Jesus. You know? Who would want to be like that? Not me. I mean, this guy's... If I know we live in a world where people have gender identity issues, but really? I mean, this is just really off the mark. And this is kind of the American, you know, suburban Jesus. He buys his cross at Ikea, do-it-yourself project, you know? No. All these are caricatures. And John says, I want you to meet the real Jesus. And he paints a picture that blows me away because it's so different than Jesus, the Lamb of God, suffering for our sins. This is Jesus at the end of the age. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire. On on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. And he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, his own blood. And his name, it's the Word of God. And the armies of heaven are following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean, coming out of his mouth as a sword, sharp and true, with which he will strike down the nations, and he will rule them with an iron scepter. And he treads the winepress of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh is this name tattooed, King of kings and Lord of lords. Listen, my friends, that's King Jesus. That's my Lord. That's my God. There's nothing weak. There's nothing ambiguous. There's nothing uncertain about him. And when he comes again, Every knee will bow before him. Every eye will see him, and we will fall at his feet. That's King Jesus. And when God's people see this scene of the triumphant Christ, the, the dead of all the ages in heaven, what do they do? God's people celebrate God's victory. And after this, I heard what sounded like a roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Any of you going to the Reds game today? There may not be a multitude there, and I hope we get to shout hallelujah, right? I mean, if you go to a sports event, you want to cheer for the victory. But listen, the the picture I get here is not just a stadium filled with people shouting, hallelujah, victory, but a thousand stadiums, 10,000 stadiums. In fact, the saved dead of all the ages, the redeemed people of all time, and they're all shouting, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Salvation belongs to a, the, 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 the God, glory to the Lamb of God. <coughs> so this is this victory scene, and I just get cold chills thinking about it. Victory, victory, victory because of Jesus. What happens next? People are shouting hallelujah, and God says, okay, enough of this. Now notice, Jesus was dressed in a road dipped in blood, his own blood. But everybody else was in white. Do you realize you don't go into battle dressed in white? You know, this, this army is not, is not going into battle. Why? Because the battle's already won. In ancient Rome, when Roman generals won a victory, they paraded into Rome, four white horses pulling a chariot, and they were dressed in white. They were celebrating victory. And this is a picture, of, a picture of God's victory at the end of the age. Jesus and His people all dressed in white because the battle's not in doubt. Hey, when Jesus comes again, there won't be a protracted conflict. It'll be over. <laughs> Reap the earth and it'll be done. The victory has been won. And God's people of all the ages, we get to be robed in the purity of that victory. And at the end of the age, God's enemies are thrown in a lake of fire. The devil and all who deceive them it was thrown into the lake of fire, burning sulfur, where the, the beast and the false prophets, all this collected uh, montage of God's enemies, they're all destroyed, tormented day and night forever and ever. And I will tell you again, I read this and I hear this glorious message. Yes, conflict is real. 
but Jesus conquers the devil. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. And of the increase of his kingdom, there will be no end. No one can stand against him. That's my Jesus. That's my king. God wins, and in Christ we win. The curtain is pulled back, and we see the glory of the Lord. Don't lose sight of this beautiful ultimate reality. Do you understand? There's a conflict. And your choices matter. Choose Jesus. Nothing is more important than your faith in Jesus. So let me ask you today, who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? Cartoon caricature? Somebody you learned about in childhood but haven't thought much since? Who is Jesus to you? Nothing matters more than your answer to that question. As for me, I declare to you today, Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, and he is the conqueror of the universe. He is my God, my Savior, my King, and I surrender. Lord Jesus, I surrender. That's my choice. What's yours? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, uh, we are grateful today for the way you love us, Lord, for the way you call us to be. Lord, faithful. God, in this uh, wilderness, this wasteland called earth, we do sense the struggle, Lord, because we get caught up in it. Lord, we get hurt. We get wounded. Father, we get picked on. Lord, and outside the United States, we get killed. We get killed, Lord because the enemies of God are trying to destroy faith on the earth. But Lord, I thank you that your kingdom is coming faster than the population of the earth is growing. I thank you, God, that people of faith are a larger percentage of the population now than any time in human history. I thank you, Lord, that the kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And Lord, I know that there will be a day when that transition is completed. Lord, until then, keep us faithful. Jesus, I'm grateful that you counsel your church and you tell us how to live in victory. God, I'm grateful that you control the universe and that you reign in glory on your throne. God, I'm glad that in the conflict that exists in this world, you are the source of victory. God, we put our trust in you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I love the image of Jesus on a white horse riding in glory at the head of the victory parade. But he's dipped in blood, dripping with blood. And the blood is his own. And it's that blood that allows everyone else to be robed in white. He paid our price. He gave himself for us. In the cup holders in front of you, you'll find these little prepackaged elements of communion. Please get them and wrestle them open, and you'll find a small piece of unleavened bread and a small portion of the crushed grape, the fruit of the vine. Jesus, in the night he was betrayed, infused these symbols with special meaning. In fact, he said, this is my body broken for you. This blood is a new covenant and my blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. And he said to them and he said to us something important. These symbols matter. But here's another thing that the scripture said. Jesus said, uh, the scripture says, as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now notice the Lord's death 
until he comes. There's this dynamic tension in the Lord's Supper. I don't know if you've ever experienced it before. The Lord's death, Jesus suffering and dying for our sins on the cross until he comes, King of kings and Lord of lords, no one will stand against him. The suffering Lamb of God and the conquering King of the universe. It's all here. It's all in our hands. Jesus wants it to be all in our hearts. So as we share the Lord's Supper today, maybe this day, this moment, the veil is pulled back. And yes, you see Jesus dying for our sins. But you also see Jesus coming and reigning in glory, leading the vast host of all the saved through all the ages. So let's eat the bread and remember the Lamb of God who died in our place. Let's drink the cup and remember that the blood of Jesus Christ forgives our sins. Lord Jesus, thank you for being the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and being the King of kings and the Lord of lords who sets all things right. God, we need your salvation. And we thank you for your victory. Please, Lord, help us to live in victory today and every day in the power of your Spirit. Amen.
and left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. Thank you again for joining us. Please feel free to follow us on our Instagram and Facebook pages to stay up to date on our current events. We hope that we can see you next week as well. Have a blessed day.